Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp, and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight, we welcome one of the great scientists of our time, Dr. David Page, director of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research at MIT, professor of biology at MIT, and investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Dr. Page became a science star very early in his career. He received his MD from Harvard in 1984 while working in the MIT lab of a leader in the Human Genome Project. He subsequently joined the Whitehead Institute and MIT faculty in 1988. Dr. Page's lab achieved early distinction by mapping the Y chromosome in 1992 and then publishing the complete sequence of the Y chromosome in 2003 with the collaboration of Washington University Genome Sequencing Center. In 2005, he was appointed director of the Whitehead Institute. Dr. Page founded the Whitehead Task Force on Genetics and Public Policy, and he serves as co-editor and associate editor, respectively, of the two major journals in the field of genetics. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and also the Institute of Medicine. Dr. Page has received a long list of distinguished awards, several of which we've listed on the Science for the Public website for this event. But we recommend also that you visit the Whitehead uh, website to see more details of Dr. Page's outstanding contributions to genetic science. Tonight, Dr. Page will focus on several points about the Y chromosome. First, its evolution. And second, why its diminutive size and the concern among experts for a long time that maleness would disappear. And third, the relationship between the sex chromosomes and some diseases and conditions that disproportionately affect either males or females. It is a very great honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. David Page. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. And I'd like to start with the evolution of the Y chromosome. Where did it come from? The X and the Y chromosomes are usually thought of as completely separate. But it turns out that 300 million years ago, when we were reptiles... Um, Believe it or our, not. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we, uh, our, our X and Y chromosomes had their beginnings as a perfectly identical pair. And so, in fact, what live on today in us as the X and the Y chromosomes were once upon a time exactly the same uh, of a member. Uh, they, were, they were members of a, an identical pair of chromosomes. Okay. All right. Now, so why did they... How did... What was the path? How did the male... Uh, right. right. Yes, exactly. What was the payoff? <laughs> well, so it turns out that... Back when we had uh, no X and Y chromosomes, 300 million years ago, our ancestors I'm referring to, sex, our sex was probably determined by the temperature we, at which we as an egg incubated. Like, this is true like today. Crocodiles. Uh, Turtles, uh, yeah, crocodiles, exactly. alligators today. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, but what happened then? So, so at that time, whether we developed as a male or a female was determined by an environmental cue almost, you could say, in software. But what okay. we then did was to move sex determination into hardware, and a mutation arose on what had been a perfectly ordinary chromosome to begin to turn it into a Y chromosome. Okay. And so this chromosome now took on a sex-determining role, a male-determining role, that it hadn't had before. Uh. That, that was the beginning of what has been a 200 or 300 million year saga, a journey of uh, this ordinary, unsuspecting <laughs> pair of chromosomes to become today's X and Y. Along the way, to sort of cut to the chase, it looks like the X chromosome retained most of the gene content 
It retained most of the innards of that ancestral chromosome that gave rise to the X and the Y, whereas the Y chromosome lost almost all of the genes that it once shared with the X chromosome. Okay. Was there anything peculiar in that split once you had sexual reproduction, this new sort of thing? Yeah. So you lost some genes in there. Uh, was there anything else in there we should know about? Goodbye, male chromosome. <laughs> and, uh, well, so first of all, I want to make clear that in, uh, before we had X and Y chromosomes, we still existed as males before that time. Our yeah, ancestors yes. uh, existed good, yeah, as males right, and right, females. Right. The males made sperm, the females make, uh, made eggs. We were reproducing sexually. And so it turns out, and, and I think people often get this point very confused, yes. that it turns out the sex chromosomes were a late addition in evolutionary terms to a perfectly functioning system of sex determination and of sexual reproduction. It is never taught this way today in the textbooks. The textbook always begins with, with the, X the X and Y, and y chromosomes, chromosome. but it's important to understand that in fact the X and Y chromosomes were a late addition um, to an already nicely tuned functioning system. So we had sexual reproduction, but yeah. it, was, uh, yeah. it was a little different yeah. from what yeah. it is. But can you just step back for one second sure. there? In terms of sexual reproduction, was there an advantage or disadvantage? Why would nature go in this direction? <laughs> right. Why not just clone so, ourselves right. endlessly? Well, it worked for great, bacteria. <laughs> well, right, right. So there, there, there are a whole bunch of questions in there. Let's yeah. just tease a couple of them okay. apart. So one is, why re reproduce sexually right. when we could just reproduce clonally? Right. Or another way of framing that question is, why bother to have males? Because, okay. <laughs> you know, because basically, if you reproduce clonally, then everybody can have offspring. If you have males and females, well, it's only the females that actually give birth. The males are just coming along as a source of a little bit of genetic variation. Oh, a little. <laughs> <laughs> right. And maybe some trouble along the way. It makes life much more complicated. Yeah. But no, seriously, people think that it is the, that what males or sexual reproduction adds to the picture is it creates an opportunity to sort of mix and match genes okay. over the generations. And, and we often think of this as being a source of evolutionary progress, but it also turns out it allows, it allows organisms to not fall behind. So it, ah, ah, right. okay. So it turns out that during the course of, um, you know, as genes are passed down through the generations, they often sustain little damaging mutations. Yes. Okay. And with sexual reproduction, it is possible to swap out or purge a damaged copy of a gene and essentially replace it with a good copy. And in fact, it is this, uh, this problem of the need to purge genes of mildly deleterious bits of damage to them it was the inability of the Y chromosome, as it began to part ways with the X chromosome, that led to the demise of so many of its genes. Ah. So in fact, the Y chromosome, despite its being called a sex chromosome, right. is actually transmitted without, in an asexual or clonal yeah, fashion. So my Y chromosome is from my father, yeah. from his father, his father, his father, his father. Yeah. Um, unlike any of our other chromosomes, which are sort of a mishmashed mix of four grandparents, yeah. eight great, eight great, great grandparents, and so on. The whole tribe. <laughs> the whole tribe, all the way back there. Yeah, right. And so it was actually the Y chromosomes going it alone <laughs> that, that led to the demise of so many of the genes that it carried. Ah, I see. <laughs> okay, now, uh, the, we understand that the Y is, became very little, yeah. but one of the big issues yeah. was why did that happen and where did those genes go and you were a major well, source of what sure, happened to that. Sure. Okay. So we've had a lot of fun reconstructing how did this, how did these 200, 300 million years play out with the yeah. X and the Y chromosomes. So first of all, part of the reason that those genes could disappear from the Y yeah. is because they were retained by the X. Ah. 
So I don't want to anthropomorphize too much, but the X chromosome seems to have had this better, efficient. you know, it, well, it was, it was more efficient at retaining, it maybe was a better nurturer of these genes once shared with the Y chromosome. Yeah. So in some sense, and since everybody has an X chromosome, yeah. males have an X, uh, females have two Xs, since everybody has an X chromosome, it meant that everyone had at least one good copy uh, of these okay, genes. Okay. So it sort of took the pressure off yes. the Y to provide those, those functions. Um, and so along the way, the Y chromosome lost a lot of genes. They were retained by the X. And then the Y started developing some other spe uh, specialties. It actually not only lost genes, but especially during the last 30 or 40 years of primate evolution, the Y chromosome has actually gotten in the business of impor importing new genes to its shores. Ah. And these have actually helped drive the Y chromosome in our species and in other primates towards a very strongly specialized role in sperm production. I so see. that male fertility today depends to a, a very significant degree on genes on the Y chromosome, many of which have been acquired by the Y chromosome during the last 30, 40 million years of evolution. That's rather rapid, isn't yeah, it? I, yeah. you know, so. and, and, this was, and this actually flew in the face. There had been a lot of ideas yeah. saying, oh my gosh, if the Y chromosome has gone its own way, this, this helps us not only understand that the, y, that the Y chromosome is going to lose genes, it helps us understand that loss of genes, but there had been, it, had, it came as a complete surprise to us and the scientific community that despite this going it alone path, that the Y chromosome was in occasional communication with other chromosomes and, and, gra and occasionally Occasion, yeah. actually acquiring a bit. Right, imperialism, yeah. right? <laughs> Maybe, well, perhaps, a little bit yeah. of importing. Right. Right. But in the... I think in the scientific community, where you know, well-respected scientists yeah. were concerned about this diminished thing, which they assume was happening like every other week or something. Yeah. Or rather, it appeared, but you said no, it happened much earlier. Well, How did that come about? Yeah, yeah. So there's been for decades now. There's been um, uh, a debate about the the. Um, the past of the Y chromosome and, and, and also predictions yeah. of its future. Right. And so I've often said I've, I've spent the better part of my career defending the honor of the Y chromosome <laughs> in the face of many insults to its character, but especially to its future prospects. Yeah. And so, so the question was, yes, the Y chromosome had lost so many genes that it once shared with the X chromosome, but what if? But could we actually reconstruct the trajectory mm -hmm, of that mm -hmm, loss? Mm -hmm. And so, about about ten years ago or twelve years ago, it was actually um, um, editorialized in the pages of uh, uh, a scientific journal of some repute called Nature. That uh, 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 it was it yeah. was it was editorialized that the Y chromosome would, at its current rate of gene loss disappear in 10 million years. Um, and, you know, on the, given that the chromosome had, only, had been around for maybe 200, 300 million right, years, right, this was right. a fairly short order, yeah, uh, right. short, short period of time being right, projected. Right. And that, that model was based on the idea, that projection was based on the idea that the Y chromosome had been losing genes at a steady drip drip, drip over those 200, exactly. 300 million years. But it years. sounds like it was an assumption. It was than, an assumption. Okay. And, and what we've found in recent years, by comparing the Y chromosome of the human with the Y chromosome, especially of the chimpanzee and yeah. of the rhesus monkey. Yeah. So we're separated from chimps by 7 million years by the, from the rhesus monkey by about 25 million years. By studying those, and, and more recently, some additional mammals, yes. we've been able to reconstruct the trajectory, uh, that's how you did that. Uh, the, the trajectory of gene loss on yeah. the Y chromosome. And what we found is that 
most of the gene loss on the Y chromosome occurred very early. Okay. So it was a well, calamitous. That was a big. That was a big find. Yeah, yeah, that was exciting. It was mm -hmm. a it was a calamitous, precipitous loss of genes, yeah. and then the Y chromosome sort of leveled out yeah. and has been sailing along pretty happily with a small but stable set of genes for actually on the order of about 100 million years. But it sounds as though because there was so much on the X that it didn't need, so yeah. that it was a very healthy, shall yeah. we say, strategy on the part yeah. of the Y. I yeah. mean, it was a, a yeah. very good adaptation kind of a thing. So it wasn't anything... It didn't. It, it evidently didn't cause that much trouble. Right. But actually, we're very intrigued now, uh, and maybe we, we can turn to it. it yeah. Uh, very intrigued by the set of genes that the Y yes. chromosome actually hung on to. Yes. And for yes. a good while, the other the other piece that fed into this understanding, this sort of prediction of the Y's imminent demise, was that the genes, the loss of genes from the Y chromosome, had been sort of a, a, a willy nilly random. Uh, exercise, yeah, yeah. but what we've come to understand very recently is that the genes that the Y chromosome hung on to, it hung on to very purposefully, um, in a sense. And we think that there are a small number of genes that persist today on the human Y chromosome, shared with the X chromosome. Yeah. Um, we think there's a small set of genes for which it's quite important to the to the individual to have two copies of these genes. Oh, how interesting. Okay. So yeah, that women right. yeah. with two X right, chromosomes right. have two copies right. of these genes. And men with one X and one Y also have two copies of these genes. We think there's a very small set, maybe as few as a dozen genes, that are shared between the X yeah. and the Y, where having two copies is critically important. That is amazing. Yeah. It seems really that those were smart moves <laughs> on the part. But right. the other thing there is that could you even have figured this out like even 20 years ago? Oh, or maybe right. I mean, no. was modern sequencing, right. did that give you the, right. the ability to see this? Well, so great, great question. So the, the only reason we've come to understand the Y chromosome at all yeah is through the age of uh, the era of genomics yeah. and the the era of gene and genome sequencing right. so we it, what's now clear is that every, that almost everything we thought about the y chromosome before the era of genome sequencing right. was wrong yeah i see we can and um, and so because the Y chromosome, and, and, and part of the explanation for that is because the Y chromosome is present, um, is passed from father to son mm -hmm, to son mm -hmm, to son mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. son, all the tools of Mendelian genetics, all, the, all those things that Mendel taught us mm -hmm. and that anybody who ever takes a genetics course learns, those things apply to genes and chromosomes that come in pairs, one from mom, one from dad. The Y chromosome doesn't follow those rules, mm -hmm. so it could never be understood through the standard tools and, and ways of thinking of genetics. So it absolutely had to wait until genome DNA sequencing really came along. Yeah. And even as the era of genome sequencing opened up, we, um, and we, you know, it was about 12 years ago, we started to get a handle on the sequence of the human Y chromosome. We thought when we had the sequence of the, of the human Y crumbs, we were so excited. Yeah. This is telling us so much. But then it's more recently when we've added, been able to add the sequence of the Y chromosome of other primates mm. and um, uh, 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 in, in the very recent past to see the Y, begin to see the Y chromosomes of other mammals. Uh -huh. We get so much richer and deeper a picture. Right. We can get a look back into right. the past of the Y chromosome. Right. And so all these notions about the Y losing genes rapidly right. Right. and then stabilizing, it comes not just from a study of the human Y right. chromosome, but from the ability to compare our Y and X chromosomes with the Y and X chromosomes 
of our uh, sister brother species. Right. Yeah. Uh, let me get this clear then. So what you've seen, and now you can you can uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, verify it, is that this loss occurred at least across mammals mm. very early. So it's the same thing. The that that why did the same thing. It didn't matter so much the species. It mm -hmm. mattered that it was the why, and they well, made that. Well, that's a great, it's a great point. So let's understand that actually the X and the Y, our X and Y chromosomes, yeah. had their beginnings um, uh, before, uh, uh, before placental mammals yeah. even arose, okay. or as yeah. they were right. arising. Right. Right. So what I mean is, our X and Y chromosomes are found in um, altered form in essentially all mammals. Okay. And so what I'm saying is the evolution of the X and the Y from an ordinary right. pair of right. chromosomes right. Okay. was actually a feature of oh. the whole, what would be called the radiation right. Right. of placental okay. mammals. Right, that just and seems so, like, yeah. So the, so the beautiful thing is that if you're, if you're seeking to understand the whole, uh, all of, of, of uh, mammalian radiation right. in its great glory, right. Right. and you want to understand the sex chromosomes, right. these are completely intertwined subjects. So you expect to see this then as you investigate more and more yeah. so mammal we're now, species. So, so we're, now, already... we're now studying in great detail, actually, um, we wish we could do more, but we're, we're focused on eight mammals. So we're studying the, uh, the human, the chimp, the rhesus monkey, the marmoset, the rat, the mouse, the bull, and for good measure, one marsupial, a South oh. American opossum. Okay. And then we actually add the chicken as a bird, as an, as an outgroup to mammals. Yeah. So it turns out that, uh, again, all of these mammals and many, many more share, to a first approximation, they share our X and Isn't Y chromosomes. that amazing? Yeah. But in some cases, just... we've been split from some of these other mammals for 80, 90, 100 million years. Yeah. So their, their X and Y chromosomes have specialized away from ours a bit. But it's all one grand experiment of nature. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Let me ask you, now when you're doing the sequencing uh, and uh, it a uh, it sounds from a lay point of view that, hey, this is a piece of cake now, you know, <laughs> right. just put it in this machine and sure. then get a reading. Sure. But when you started this and you were right there at the yeah. beginning, sure. I think it was evidently very difficult mm. to do. What has changed? Why was well, it difficult so and what's changed? It actually remains difficult. Oh, I see. To just the chromosome, the Y chromosome. So it turns okay. out the it turns out that Yes, today the sequencing technology has evolved, um, ha has improved to such an extent that we'll now talk about, you know, sequencing someone's genome for yes, medical right, purposes. Right, um, right. Not quite at the drop of a hat, but we're getting but it's there. It's getting very close, fast. But, yeah. But, well, but there's something. This is a, a somewhat different thing. Here we're talking about generating the sequence of the Y chromosome of the human or of another species yeah. for the first time. Oh, I see. So actually, just... what we've become really good at in medical genetics is resequencing I the see. human genome. I see. But it Thank turns out that, that... Um, establishing the reference sequence of a Y chromosome is particularly difficult because, as we found, we didn't know this before we got deeply into it, it turns out that Y chromosomes carry massive uh, uh, mirror images of, uh, of their own sequence. <laughs> so for instance, the human Y chromosome carries eight very large palindromes. Oh, for goodness sake. So you know, a yeah, palindrome a is a sequence yeah, that like reads the same. Mirror. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So the palindromes on the human Y chromosome can be incredibly large. The largest one is three million letters in length. Oh one dear. and a half million letters. Yeah. And then another copy flipped around in the opposite direction. And the standard methods of sequencing, which involve taking our DNA and chopping it up into little bits, sequencing all these little bits, and then asking a computer program to put it all together. Yeah. Things like these palindromes completely befuddle 
the standard methods oh, of see. assembling a genome sequence. I see. And this, what this has meant is that it has required a much more painstaking approach and a much more sort of deliberate um, and uh, uh, maybe compulsive, I should say, approach <laughs> to actually accurately assemble yeah. the Y chromosome. Yeah. But uh, of the human and actually of the other, of the other species. Yeah, so right, it's required right. it's just an this. extra level of investment, uh, an extra level of work. And this helps explain why actually by, by today we, ne we have a rough cut sequence of the, of the uh, genomes of many dozens of mammals. But we today have published um, the Y chromosome sequence only of um, three primates, oh, human, chimp, and rhesus. It's we're still way so behind. Difficult. It's we're still, we're so still difficult. behind. Yeah, right. We're working to we're working to pick up the pace. Now. Well, at least now we understand why this has been yeah. such a, a challenge. And yeah. I was thinking that it was because initially the whole mess was a challenge, but then there was some yeah. extra difficulty yeah. around the why. Yeah. But there is. Well, there were a couple. Yeah. There were a couple of things going on there. So one was, um, yeah, the whole. At, at the outset, sequencing genomes was a very hard thing. Right, right. But then, as I mentioned, in the case of the Y chromosome, it is inherently more, a more difficult target to sequence right. than the other chromosomes. But then there was another, for a variety of, um, uh, for a variety of reasons, when genomes were being, when the genomes of new organisms were being sequenced, the decision was taken to, fe to sequence the female genome. Actually, because it was easier. Well, or... um, because there were there were a number of reasons. It was first, it was <laughs> first it was assumed. It was actually understood. The Y had been under such sort of <laughs> um, negative publicity for oh, so dear. long. It was actually assumed that it wasn't worthwhile oh. sequencing the Y chromosome. I'm not making this up. Um, um, and so, science is so, so embarrassing. Part the, <laughs> so part of the rationale was, well, let's just do the female because we don't really want the Y. I mean, it won't really add that much anyway, ah. really. And I'm not making this up. Um, and but there was another reason, which was that the methods for sequencing the human genome were designed to um, uh, with. Uh, with the realization that for most of the chromosomes in our genomes, there would be two copies in the mix. Yeah, yeah. And so there was a statistical sampling method that was put in place that said, I'm going to ask that you have two copies of the chromosome. I will fold them in as if they were together yeah, as if yeah, they were yeah, one, yeah. and I will call that the reference sequence. I see. And so the decision was taken to sequence female genomes because then you'd have two copies of the X chromosome. Right. And if you'd sequenced a male genome, right. you would underrepresent yes. the X and exactly. the Y. You wouldn't, get a, you wouldn't get a decent coverage right. of either. Right, so that okay. was the excuse. So there were a whole set of reasons. Yes. So in other words, it's taken a dedicated add-on effort right. to capture the Y chromosome. Right. Uh, I, I, I see that now, but it, I'm amazed that it took a long time to get past some of these um, obstacles that, uh, and yeah. also the thinking. Uh, well, and I would say these, me these mental obstacles are actually still there. And it's why I say I've, I've had so much fun sort of traveling with the Y chromosome yeah. in the face of all of these thoughts right. that it wasn't worth, it actually wasn't worth examining. Right, well, you were sort of out there alone too, weren't Pretty you, much for so. a long time, right. but right. now they're more respectful, <laughs> <That's> right? right. <laughs> it's, it's all in vogue, but it just changed very quickly. But it's a, a wonderful story, a wonderful story of science, mm. of a correction mechanism mm. that people go along for a number of reasons with certain assumptions, and whammy, you're completely wrong. And you have very yeah. prestigious yeah. journals, yeah. You know, uh, telling you what's right one day and then it's wrong. Absolutely, so you have Absolutely. had a good time with it. Then. Well, it's been you know, the, it's it's. I felt really privileged to travel with yeah. the Y, and then but the, you took a chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there were um, you know, I've been traveling with the Y chromosome for I don't know thirty thirty five years uh, now, yeah. and um, it's it's a lot of fun to look back 
at what did people say about the Y chromosome yes. 30 years ago, yeah. right? And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't very favorable. Right, um, and it, even it was recently. Thought, yeah, it was just... thought, so it's actually very interesting. If we take the clock back two or three decades, right. it was generally assumed then that there was one uh, function of the Y chromosome, maybe one gene that was involved in, um, um, in directing the fetus to develop as an anatomic male. Ah, and that's Not all. as an anatomic female. Right. That was, that was widely understood to be the only function of the I Y see. chromosome. And so what, what has come to light in, in recent decades is this incredible specialization of the Y chromosome. Uh, well, I should say, first of all, that, that um, original surmise is correct. There yeah. is, in fact, a gene on the Y chromosome that yeah, plays a pivotal role but it's not in the sex whole... determination. But in addition, yeah. there are many genes on the Y chromosome that are involved in sperm production. Yeah. But then what has, I'd say, come to light most recently is a set of a dozen genes that are, that are shared with the X chromosome that are actually expressed, that appear to be active in all the tissues and yes. cell types of the body and that have no obvious connection to sex differentiation as classically taught in medical schools. Right, and still in medical still, schools. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and that is really new. I, I, I hope you don't have the big battle there, but yeah. I believe that, that has that been the source of your interest in these male-female bias diseases? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. I, yeah. I, we have some other things to get into. Sure. Let's talk about that because sure. that's a new wrinkle, yeah, I yeah, believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how yeah, yeah. long has that been out there. I mean, we all know there well, are disproportionate... Yeah. So there are uh, many diseases. Yeah. You know, it's actually almost the rule, not the exception, that e even for diseases outside the reproductive tract. So let me back yeah, into this yeah, and right, say, right. you know, obviously things like um, prostate cancer, yeah. that affects men. Right, breast probably, cancer, yeah. <laughs> breast cancer yeah. primarily affects women. Yeah, right. Um, Uterine cancer affects women. So we could go down the reproductive right. tract and right. think about right. Right. disorders that affect one sex or the other for obvious anatomic reasons. But then there are many diseases outside the reproductive tract that affect tissues and organs that are common to men and women. Many diseases that occur much more yeah. frequently or more severely yeah. in males than in females or, or in females than in males. Right. And uh, and medicine has known about this yeah. forever, uh, but it isn't a very, it, it hasn't been uh, a, a closely examined question. Yeah. And actually what I, what I find most interesting is that there's been very little thought given uh, across uh, uh, the sweep of human disease about this, this question in general. In other words, so let's take the, uh, I could mention the autoimmune diseases. Yeah. Rheumatoid arthritis, yes. much more common in, in women than in men. Lupus, yeah. the same thing. Or Turners. I could, or I could, well, Turners, yeah, I could right. or I could flip around and say uh, autism, yeah. or autism spectrum disorders, much more common in right. boys than in girls. Right. Um, so we're just now beginning and when I say we, I mean the whole biomedical enterprise. We're just beginning to actually name this question. And oh, to just the question. It, really, and to approach yeah, it yeah. a little more systematically. Right. So I believe that each of these, in the past, each of these diseases that showed a sex or gender bias was seen in isolation. Ah, very good. And you see yes, what I'm yes, saying? Is, yes, well, I, maybe you'd say, let's take great. the autoimmune disorders yeah. and think about them as a group. Right. But what I'm suggesting yeah. is that we now need to take this whole sweep right. of disorders and diseases that show strong sex or gender biases right. in incidence or severity. And we need to begin to uh, disentangle the underlying causes right. of these biases. Right. And so I think there are many, um, we don't have any, we have very few, if any, answers 
today. Right, but you're asking the question. It sounds like that's the yeah. important thing because it's for the first time that, yeah. some, that you're out there saying yeah. why. Yeah, so right. I would say the prevailing view, when I talk to my, my uh, physician colleagues, and I've got lots of them in different areas yes. of medicine, when I ask them, what causes these sex, these right. sex or gender biases in, in the diseases that you study or that, right. you, that, you, that you care for? Um, the answer I almost always get is, I don't have a clue. Right. If well, I press, we got that far. They right. don't know a clue. If I press harder, <laughs> the answer is usually, it could be the sex hormones. Ah, uh, yes. So it has to okay. be the hormones. Well, but you went be, further than but that. But what, what we begin to wonder is, yes, I have no doubt that the sex hormones, estrogens and androgens, right, right. play important roles in these uh, sex and gender biases in disease incidence and severity. Right. But we begin to wonder whether some of these genes yeah. that are shared between the X right. and the Y chromosomes, whose significance was uh, not appreciated until very recently, yeah. and I mean this year. Oh, this year, <laughs> wow. Um, and, and when we recognize that these XY gene pairs are actually expressed throughout the body. Yeah. So we begin to say, oh my gosh, it could be that the that even the cells of our skin, Your the cells of our gut, yeah. at some level they may know whether they're XY right. or XX. And could that and perhaps that contributes to these very different uh, predispositions on the part of males and females to a wide variety right. of diseases outside the reproductive tract. Well, let me ask, maybe it's still very new, but this is another thing. Does, do you see this in other species as well, mm. even in our ape mm. relatives? Mm. Do would you see this difference between male and female diseases if such a thing exists, or is it just us? I think we, you know, I think the uh, it, it may well exist. I would oh, be, surpri I would nobody, be surprised yeah. if it doesn't. It certainly exists in... Um, uh, it certainly exists in mice, in laboratory uh, mice, okay. where you study where you study various disease models are created and studied in mice. There can be enormous sex biases uh -huh. there as well. So I think it would be it, very surprising be, yes. if it were not the case exactly. across the entirety of the animal kingdom. Right. It's just that we, of course, are most concerned about our own exactly. our own health. Well, and that's those and are so, the things when right. we talk about diseases, we mean yeah. us uh, too. Yeah. But the uh, the other thing is it seems like that really buttresses the argument that no, we need to be looking at this genetic thing, that the, at these chromosomes that are playing sure. a very large sure. role because it, it, from the public view, we hear hormones all the time. And that's sure. one of the questions I was sure. going to ask you is that we have these endocrine disruptors ah. that are ubiquitous now, and we're seeing sex ambiguity and stuff in, say, reptiles and amphibians mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. But if we pursue this, how do, that's hormonal. Mm -hmm. okay. Does that, it, it, how does that affect what How you're does talking this about, all the, fit like the disease, How sort does of this like all that, fit exactly. Yeah. I, if you had from the from the hormonal argument, you'd say, well, look for autism in reptiles <laughs> or something. Mm -hmm. like that. Well, so this, you know, we have this explosion of yeah. information and interest yeah. in the question of environmental endocrine disruptors exactly. and so on. You know, what I would say is that. Um, um, uh, we need so much more basic fundamental research done in that space that I, I can't, so it's almost, I think actually our public storytelling in that yeah. space yeah. is actually, um, it has foundation in the scientific literature, yeah. but the scientific literature in that, in that space is so meager. Uh. We need so much more research in that arena uh, and it is a, it is, it, it, the whole question of the endocrine disruptors and such is, um, it presents questions of bewildering scientific complexity yes. because of the number of chemicals <laughs> that well, we as a species have introduced into our environment. Right, right. And probing how 
each of those many, many chemicals might disrupt our, our systems uh, is far beyond the capacity of um, uh, the very limited uh, corner of the scientific enterprise that's devoted to those questions at present. What is striking, though, is how fragile our capacity and the capacity of, of our species' capacity and, and of other species' capacity for sexual reproduction is to environmental um, uh, uh, disruption. Yeah. What I'm saying is that there's something about sex, the mechanisms of sexual reproduction right. that make them very vulnerable to chemical perturbation. Uh, right. That's a commonality that is emerging. Yeah. But why that is why and how sexes, it plays yes. out, we really, well, I, understand. I, I, I don't want to pretend that we know more than, than we do. Right. I think we're just, again, beginning to scratch the surface of those questions and how this all works. And of course, with an eye towards, well, what can we do about this? Well, that's true. But also then the question going back to these male or female prevalent yeah. diseases, yeah. what will that mean if you uh, have this additional factor, yeah. which is so pervasive right yeah. now? Yeah. So we're not necessarily seeing that, I guess, in humans so much. I, yeah. uh, but I would say that these two, uh, right now I would say that these two um, um, sort of storm systems yeah. uh, have not yet collided yeah. intellectually. Okay. So what I'm saying is one storm system right. is why so many diseases outside the reproductive tract with a strong male or female right, bias? Right, right, and that's where you're at. Yeah. Right. So that's one whole set of right. questions. Another set of questions is, what is happening in our environment that is disrupting the sexual reproduction of so many species? Right. And in many cases, we actually look to other species, actually even including alligators, yes. with temperature-dependent right, sex. Right, right, right. The disruption of sexual reproduction in these many species is sort of serving as the canary in the environment yeah. uh, to raise our own concerns. But what I'm saying is these two storm systems, sex yes. bias and disease and uh, environmental disruption of sexual reproduction, these have not yet, to my knowledge, have not yet intellectually collided okay. in the way that you're suggesting. Or converge. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe they will. Um, so we'll have to see in the future what that uh, okay. looks like. So, but we, we, that's not a part of that. Uh, your concern immediately is not that you are well, taking the classic male-female. I'm very concerned about both of these. Yeah. Uh, and I'm very interested in both of these developments. Right. But I, I, for one, don't have a way of thinking about them together. Yes, right, yeah. I understand. Yeah. Um, but in terms of where are you now with looking at the male, female, what shall we say, biased diseases yeah, sure. or conditions? Because yeah. there are syndromes, there are conditions, there are diseases. So we're in the, we're, we're barely out of the starting blocks. Okay. So, but beginning, we're trying to, um, figure out, actually, how to approach these questions. So um, we need new tools. We need new ways of thinking. And what I'll, what I'll say, one of the ways we're beginning um, is to think about simply cataloging the molecular differences uh, between males and females yeah. throughout our bodies. Yes. So I like to make the analogy back to the time several centuries ago when the early anatomists began to dissect human cadavers. And they were surprised. And <laughs> discovered that we actually had oh, a circulatory yeah, system. Right. We had a heart and there were all these, <laughs> these pipes coming exactly. out of it and things like that. Exactly. Oh, and said, this is right. how it works. Right. Well, guess what? Almost all of those early dissections were done on male cadavers. Oh. Oh, how well, about then that? Then somebody dissected a female body, and, oh and they God. were shocked. <laughs> saying, oh, something is wrong. It's, uh, it's, um, 
And so I would say that where we are today with, respect, with respect to our molecular inventory yeah. is where the anatomists were before oh, they'd actually dissected a female body. <laughs> well, let me ask this then, is that when you were working on the why, you really, I think, were a pioneer out there sort of on your own. You didn't have much, yeah. an army of people saying, yes, this is right. In fact, there were detractors. But now, with this, mm. uh, and something that's been just ignored, really, yeah. uh, I guess, in, sure. in terms, uh, do you, is it as difficult to convince people uh, that we need to look at this chromosomal factor mm. uh, in terms found, of these diseases? So I've really only been talking with colleagues in medicine and yeah. in science about this within the last year ah, or 18 so months. so it really is new then. It's very new, yeah. but I would say the reception has been um, exhilarating. Oh, wonderful. I mean, people are excited about yeah. this idea, and, right. they, and I think actually the time is ripe yeah. to, um, to get serious yes. about trying to understand, and actually uh, trying to understand these sex biases. And it's worth recognizing it's against a backdrop of now, in this era of genomics, yes. there is much talk of personalized yes. medicine. Yes, yes. Okay, well, it turns out, um, you know, so in thinking about personalized medicine, we're thinking about how can we learn from someone's, the sequence of someone's genome, yeah. together with other information, about diseases at which they might be at particular risk, and yeah. about which we might yeah. do something right. uh, in a preventative sense, right. for, for instance. But I would argue that actually the way we've, we've, been, we've had a unisex model of yeah. uh, personalized medicine. And that will <laughs> and, now change. And I think that absolutely has to change. Yeah. When, in fact, the single greatest identifiable risk factor for many diseases yeah. is are you a male or are you a female? Right, We right. need to actually acknowledge that yeah. and take that into our thinking and, and see what we can make of it. Right. Um, you know, so there may actually, for some of these diseases, the disease in males and the disease in females may in some sense be different disorders. Oh, that is interesting. Even if we give them the same yes, name. exactly. How interesting which you would uncover right. as, a, as a, a result of this, because it just sounds like a whole new direction. It does yeah, yeah. come at an opportune time when there is this sense of we need to personalize medicine much yeah. more, and it's within our capacity, certainly right. in, the, in the future. But what an exciting prospect this I time. So. I'm glad we got to meet you before you get the Nobel. Uh, <laughs> That's very kind. <laughs> we have to stop there, and thank I would know people would like to ask you a few questions. Sure. So I thank you very much thank for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Tonight. It was wonderful. Yes. Lots of okay. Fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I will let people just go ahead and uh, sure. talk with you. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Yes. Start. Um, my name's Regina. And I see what I get a lot. Yes. Um, Hi, Regina. All right. So, and does the sequencing provide any light on some of these 12 ish genes that yeah. shares with the, with the X? Uh, any general categories, for example, kinases or something? Any idea oh, what these genes Oh, what these genes are? Might be? Well, so it's very, very exciting, Regina, because it turns out these, um, if there is a broad theme among these 12 genes, they look to be global regulators of gene activity. Okay, so they include um, chromatin modifiers, mm -hmm. transcription factors, translation factors. So these are what, what it, it really blew our minds when we began to see this sort of commonality among them. So it looks like they, you know, the, I, I would, I th we describe them as um, global regulators of gene activity. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay. And it turns out that actually the X member of many of these XY pairs, uh, in some cases the, the X side of the pair is already being has already been implicated mm -hmm. in, some, in some diseases. Mm -hmm. So it's the Y side hasn't been looked at so much. Mm -hmm. 
But these, what I'm saying is, these 12 XY gene pairs are very, very, from a, from a modern biologist's point of view, these are very sexy pairs. Yeah. They're really, uh, they have a lot of name recognition. Yes. Already. The X genes already have name recognition, yeah. already have developing literatures. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's very exciting for us because in some cases, some of these XY gene pairs we had discovered as long ago as uh, 17 years ago. <laughs> but in the ensuing 17 years, the cell biologists and the biochemists have been hard at work telling us what these, what these gene pairs uh, do, what the, what the products of these gene pairs do. And so it's, uh, when we come back and put it all together and look at it now, it's, these are a very exciting, very exciting pair of genes. Not yeah. surprising, actually, but exciting. But it, and then I think this actually contributes to the enthusiasm, the you know, I, it's actually so surprising. I finally have something which meets with an almost immediately enthusiastic right. response, and people, I think, and you know, and it's it's actually very gratifying uh, because in the for so many years, the view was that uh, this research into the Y chromosome, it has you know, it's of some, you know, it's it's sort of curious. Right. But it's, it's a, very, a rather arcane subject, right? A very limited uh, uh, significance. Yeah, yeah. But once you start saying, oh, mm -hmm. how about lupus? Mm -hmm. uh, how about autism? Mm -hmm. um, and you start saying, oh, you mean all of medicine mm -hmm. might be the playground now mm -hmm. for thinking about this? It completely yeah. changes the way, completely changes the way yeah. people think about it and receive the information. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, well, yes, we actually just published, uh, and I should have sent you the the, the preprint. Um, three, three papers in Nature, or something. Well, no, we just published we just published a uh, an article in um, Nature earlier this year. Um, so, um, uh, and yeah, I think it was in uh, April. Late April, late April, yeah, yeah, my, yeah. My question is, I mean, just something some more for you to do. Have you looked at the regulatory regions of these 12 genes, and are they the same in the X and in the Y? Fantastic oh. question, right. So that is, in fact, um, uh, one of the graduate students in my lab is now uh, looking at precisely that question. So, so the interesting thing is now, if we think about these 12 XY gene pairs, the question becomes, are the products of these genes identical in function? Do they function equivalently? But maybe even if they, even if they function equivalently, maybe they're not expressed in quite the same way. And so, so we're very interested in the possibility that um, that evolution has yielded has resulted in slightly different regulations of the X and the Y flavors of these of these genes. Really great question. Yeah, that's right at the cutting edge. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, if someone is older in the sequence, they will cause diseases. If you yes. the medicine, it will put a uh, sequence in the right order or kill some virus or something. Let me make sure I understand. So you're saying if, in some cases, an alteration in the sequence of these genes causes a disease, yes. then um, were you asking how should we correct the, how should we correct, well, okay. So, you know, I think there is a lot of excitement um, in just the last year or two around new genome editing methods. No, actually, actually uh, DNA. Um, so some methods for actually changing the spelling or maybe correcting the spelling. Now, this, these methods have in the last, just in the last two or three years, actually in the last year or two, uh, become the rage, all the rage in, in uh, modern biology. They've been, they've been incorporated into many, many experiments. Um, people are just beginning to think about and just beginning to apply these to the possibility of correcting defects 
responsible for human disease. But I think we're going to be hearing a lot, lot more in the near future about actually correcting spelling errors. Um, yeah.